This program is brought to you with support from the U.S. EPA. We're here to present the EFC Network Podcast. The Environmental Finance Center Network is a partnership of 12 centers serving 10 EPA regions. The EFCN provides training and technical assistance to small water and wastewater systems. This podcast series has been designed to help system personnel improve technical, managerial, and financial capacity of the utilities and communities they serve. Okay, Uh, welcome everybody. This is Sarah Diefendorf with the Environmental Finance Center West. We're located in Oakland, California, and we have with us Elaine McCarty. Uh, I am the Executive Director of EFC West, and Elaine is the Associate Director of EFC West, and uh, we're going to share the interview duties today. And today we have uh, Justin Overton, who is the Executive Director of Coosa Waterkeeper, which is located in Birmingham, Alabama. As a river keeper, Justin patrols and documents the Coosa River and its tributaries from the land, water, and air. She looks for pollution problems, responds to citizen complaints, researches and analyzes polluters' permits, collects pollution samples for laboratory analysis, educates the public about the beauty of the river and threats to it, advocates compliance with environmental laws, works on finding solutions to pollution problems. In short, she speaks for the Coosa River. So welcome, Justin, and um, please just tell us a bit about the Coosa Waterkeeper and the Coosa River. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, Coosa Riverkeeper was founded in 2010 after being named the 10th most endangered river by American Rivers, a national environmental organization. And that was due to the Coosa River suffering the greatest mass extinction in North American history. So a lot of folks that may not have ever visited Alabama or or are familiar with our state, Alabama is a river state. We've got more miles of rivers and streams than anywhere else in the nation. And so a group of um, ragtag conservationists and environmentalists decided to band together and give the Coosa River a voice. So rivers have a head and a mouth, but they don't always have a voice to speak for themselves. And that's why Coosa River Keeper is here, is we're here to speak for the river when there are issues um, that are, whether they're legacy or they're emerging issues, um, as well as for the folks that use our waterways. Because in, in the southeastern United States in particular, our rivers, just because of our climate, are often used for recreation. And so the Coosa River in particular is a highly recreated water body um, and series of water bodies because the reason that there was such a huge biodiversity loss is the Coosa River has been impounded um, multiple times for hydroelectric generation. So our river um, changed from a rocky bottom shoal wide uh, meandering waterway into a series of reservoirs, which many folks know and love um, by the names of Neely Henry Lake, Logan Martin Lake, Lay Lake, Lake Mitchell, and Lake Jordan, and then the tailwaters of the Coosa where she runs free before she meets the Tallapoosa to join the Alabama. So our organization works in about 220 miles of the 280 miles of the Coosa system. And we work in about 5,000 square miles of the state of Alabama, which is primarily rural communities um, that love getting outside and boating and fishing and hunting and enjoying the aesthetic value as well as the economic benefit um, that our river brings to communities. So it's um, it's a pleasure to get to work to protect the river that I grew up playing in and on and around. Um, but also the same river that provided my drinking water the majority of my childhood. Um, and so our organization um, has grown significantly over the years. We now have a staff of six, um, which is still quite small <laughs> in relation to where we work and And the issues that our river has, Um, last year, the Coosa was named the fifth most endangered river in the nation um, due to nutrient pollution and ongoing lack of enforcement from our state agencies for chicken, um, the spreading of chicken litter and just the the chicken processing, um, as well as the CAFOs that exist within the broiler belt. A lot of people think of this south as the Bible belt, but the Coosa River is also the broiler belt. There are more chickens raised um, and slaughtered in our watershed of of the Coosa River system than anywhere else um, in the nation. So don't forget that, don't forget the broiler belt. (laughs) Um, But it's great, this this river is um, still teeming with biodiversity, but it's also still very much dealing with some of these issues um, that are so preventable 
with the right planning and the right people in the right room. So I'm excited to talk to y'all because I feel like that's a lot of what y'all bring to the work that that we do is helping us get in front of the right folks to make changes that that might be outside of our normal tools. You know, we use the Clean Water Act to hold polluters accountable and there is a time and place for litigation, in my opinion. Um, but there's also a time and a place for open conversation and to be able to hear each other and learn and and provide some opportunities for non-traditional allies. So I've learned a lot from working with y'all about the ways in which we can be a little bit more open-minded and hearted um, to the folks that have permits that discharge into our river system. Thank you. Yeah, um, so thanks, Justin. Um, it's always so wonderful to hear about the marvelous work you all are doing. Um, tell us about the wastewater problems you face with specifically within the watershed, please. Sure. Well, there, there are a myriad of them. Um, so I'm going to just just say them to you in, in no particular order of importance, because I believe the right to adequate sanitation is something that we all deserve, um, especially if we're going to use our rivers. Um, the, there's a, a saying down here, I don't know if it is you know, throughout the country, but the solution to pollution is dilution. And I feel like our river system is a testament to that. We have used the Coosa River as a um, opportunity to get our, rid of our waste out of sight, out of mind. And there has, there has been a lack of long-term planning when it comes to infrastructure and ongoing maintenance um, for the utilities that operate within our basin. So first and foremost, we have failing wastewater systems. We've got several lagoons within our ba within our basin, which are a pretty archaic way of dealing with waste. But when you have a very small community with a very limited tax base, that's the best that they might be able to do right now. So our organization monitors NPDES or National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permits to monitor ongoing compliance or their lack of. And when there are issues, our organization goes and collects data to essentially spot check compliance because they self-report data, the utilities in Alabama. So of course, you know, the average person, if they have the opportunity to grade their own paper, they're gonna give themselves an A. So I think it's very important that there are groups like us that go out and uh, do our own independent data collection to ensure that what's being reported is actually what is entering our waterways. So in addition to the failing systems, we also have a huge issue with biosolid and septage application on our land, which impacts waterways tremendously. I um, mean, it's a very difficult thing to track down. And it's also a very difficult thing to enforce because a lot of these folks are getting this beneficial use fertilizer. And I'm giving air quotes right now. Um, and they have no idea the heavy metals, the PFAS concentrations, and the pathogens that they are unknowingly spreading onto their land. So I think it's super important to also recognize that we come from a largely agricultural community. Um, and so it's really important that as we address waste, waste issues that we're also being mindful of where that waste is going. So we don't wanna waste from one community um, to be land applied to, to another community. Um, and especially when that happens, that tends to be in lower income rural areas. Um, where the maybe folks are not as organized or have as large or as loud of a voice. We also have um, a lot of issues when it comes to cattle and cattle in our creeks. So I know that might be something that seems kind of wild, um, but exclusion fencing for cattle is a huge opportunity to, when we think about waste on our waterways. And I know that's not necessarily human waste or isn't human waste, but it is certainly something that compromises water quality. Um, as well as can, uh, you know, folks that are recreating on our waterways are oftentimes when people send us videos of them paddling in kayaks past cows in creeks. Um, and, you know, and I think in that moment, there's like a wow factor. Um, but what if you really were to stop and think cattle don't care where they use the restroom um, and people and also cattle can be that's a dangerous situation for paddlers um, for them to be passing by by cattle. Um, and then. Finally, um, and I think this is probably, you know, I hope fairly obvious, is our concerns about waste really um, outside of the use of the Clean Water Act and the citizen suit provision is I don't want anyone unknowingly swimming in water that has sewage in it or has any sort of harmful pathogen in it. So our organization tests um, for bacteria and lots of other water quality parameters every week throughout the summer. Because in our state, we don't have a sewage notification or right to know 
legislation. So I don't have a right to know where sewage is entering waterways near me. And right now, SSO or sanitary sewer overflow notification is really, really, really terrible if you are trying to make informed decisions. So that's another aspect of our work with waste that's maybe not so directly related to the waste itself, but the public notification or their lack of um, for folks that are swimming in water that can cause ear infections or cause skin infections or gastrointestinal infections. And, and for folks that are in communities that might, you know, um, may not have, for instance, like rural hospitals or rural healthcare, I mean, they're, they're dealing with a lot of bigger systemic issues than just swimming in sewage. It might be there's not a doctor um, close to them, or they don't have internet at their house to even Google if that's cellulitis or not. So we're also trying to prevent people from coming in contact with waterways that could be compromised while also holding them accountable. And just sort of building on that, um, sort of of everything that you've discussed, what have you seen be sort of like the biggest impact um, from wastewater discharges into the watershed? So we have had several um, cases um, and, st and state and a federal court against wastewater treatment plants. And one of the, the main ones has been excess E. coli and also excess residual chlorine um, coming from, from that particular facility. It's really frustrating because our state agency is more interested in protecting the permit holder than, than enforcing the permit limitations. And so it can be very, very contentious and difficult once we are moving into litigation, have already filed our notice of intent to sue, because our state agency will oftentimes on the 59th day, on the 11th hour, will overfile our case. And so that's why it's been very, very important for us to have our own data because we can still stand on our data, not just the self-reported data. So I think tactically that has been a really important thing for our organization. And I do think that's unique to River Keepers is that we are out in the field in a boat, on foot, in waders, actually going and collecting that data. Um, and, and that data being something that we own. And so that allows us to continue to pursue some of these, um, these cases. Thank you. Sure. And Justin, so you just described some of the um, impacts and um, from the wastewater. I wonder if you can say a little bit more about what should be done to address them. Um, you've already talked about a couple, but maybe highlight one or two. Um, I think the greatest low-hanging fruit is public notification. And I say that because I think that there's two reasons that's important. First and foremost, that it educates the people in real time about where water quality is compromised. And it's not just for recreation. I mean, we've got manholes overflowing. Kids are splashing in manholes, not knowing exactly what they're in right um so i think the public notification would also be important because that is a tool for them to really understand and get pressure from the communities that they serve to be like why are we having ssos in this area consistently so that's also why a lot of it's been a, very difficult to get people to want to do public notification because that transparency will require them just through the the court of public opinion to like do something um the other sort of aspect I think uh, for us has been commenting on certain permits. You know, that's that is a tool that I have not found to be incredibly helpful to change permit limitations, but it is a matter of public record. So if we were to pursue litigation, that I can say I checked that box, like we made comments about this, we tried. Um, so that has been um, sort of another tool. And then last, I think a lot of people just do not understand the wastewater system and the treatment system at all. They think they, they, they flush it and it's like out of sight, out of mind. And I know it's a dirty business, you know, and it's not necessarily fun to talk about unless you're the three of us and we'll talk about wastewater all day long. Um, but it's a necessary thing. It's very similar to something like a landfill and that like, that's the solution we have right now, unfortunately. But there's a way that we can do it better and smarter that's really focused and rooted in what's just for the communities these are in. Because we get a lot of reports for odors and things like that. And that impacts people's quality of life also. It's not just that it, the waste is entering the waterway. You've got folks with all kinds of headaches and health issues. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question entirely, but I gave it a shot. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. And um, so thinking about sort of the utilities and the wastewater managers and, and their own difficulties in managing waste, wastewater, um, how can someone in your position, your work, help them, help utilities um, be better protectors of the watershed? Well, I think that part of it, if I'm if I'm going to be 100% honest, is that it's really easy for people like me to make a lot of assumptions, um, make a lot of assumptions about the wastewater operators and that that because from from where we're standing, we're there for the waterways that are voiceless and for the people that use them and rely on them. So I think it's really easy for us to have our postures to naturally be a bit defensive towards each other. Um, because they're like, there are those river keepers again, coming to just start some shit up on it. Can I say shit? Can they hear me say shit? They can edit it out. It <laughs> okay, great. Well, I'll say it to start some stuff. Um, and, and I think it's like, they think that's how we make our money. Like, I think there's a huge misconception that like we sue people so that we can make payroll when I'm like, that's not at all how that works. So I think that there is an opportunity for us to spend more time together and try to look at each other as humans, because some of these folks I understand have limitations within their operating budget. It is not just negligence entirely. Some of it is I think they're not really connecting the dots, that they're they're part of a system that, uh, and working within a collection system, if they have a lot of I and I issues, for instance, they may not think like, oh, that's gonna like impact where I'm fishing this weekend. Like they do not connect that that water quality could be compromised, or at least that has been my experience. So I think that getting in the same room and having these conversations is important um, because if somebody doesn't want to have a productive conversation, then I know I have other tools like sending a courtesy letter, like issuing a 60 day notice of intent to sue. Um, because I'd like to give someone the benefit of the doubt that maybe they don't know, or maybe they don't know, they don't know where to start um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity um, for more collaboration as long as it's rooted in transparency. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Um, well, that's it for our questions. And I just want to thank you for kind of laying out not only um, how you have helped to protect the legacy of the Coosa River and, and protect this watershed, but also, I think you've shown like what a role model that um, other organizations like you that yours are that are just getting started or really want to kind of advance and and have more impact could do. So thanks for the inspiration. That you oh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you saying that because it certainly doesn't feel that way. Some days I feel like I'm banging my head um, against the discharge pipe. So thank you. I needed that today more than you know. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Justin. All right. Thank you very much. And um, that wraps up today. And uh, thanks to everyone for being here. Thank you to all our listeners for tuning into this episode of the EFC Network Podcast, brought to you with support from the U.S. EPA. Be sure to stay tuned for future EFC Network podcast episodes.